Welcome. Uh, thanks for coming. Hi, Phyllis. Uh, thanks for coming to uh, Coffee with a Cop this month. Uh, this month, we have a special presenter. Uh, Brad Callender is from the Phoenix Police Department. He's assigned to the Threat Mitigation Unit at the Arizona Counterterrorism Information Center. Uh, it is also known as the Arizona Fusion Center, and it's a joint effort between law enforcement uh, agencies operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, provides intelligence, investigative techniques, and technical support uh, that is critical to Arizona and to the um, country's homeland security efforts. Detective Callender, welcome. And you. you can start your program when you're ready. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chief Winger. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. As Chief Good morning. said, my name is Detective Brad Callender. I'm a detective with the Phoenix Police Department's Homeland Defense Bureau, and I'm currently serving on our unit, which is the Threat Mitigation Unit. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying that we protect and harden critical infrastructure within not only our city, uh, Phoenix, but also the state of Arizona. So we are a regional resource. My unit is. Um, a little bit about myself. I've been on the department for 16 years. Um, before that, I did eight years of active duty with the United States Navy. Uh, and then as soon as I got out of there, uh, I then went into the reserves and did uh, 20. Retired in 2018 as the chief petty officer uh, working in our intelligence community. And so that kind of set me up for getting into the ACTIC uh, primarily. I did six years on patrol uh, in South Phoenix. I uh, had a blast doing it. And then as soon as I tested for the detective position, I've been up here for about 10 years. Um, and so uh, the current position that I hold right now uh, is that of the Community Liaison Program Coordinator. Uh, that's ultimately what we're going to talk about today and what we as the ACTIC uh, resources, training resources that we can provide to the community um, through us and through our partnership. So without further ado, so ultimately, what is the CLP, the Community Liaison Program? Well, ultimately, like I said, it serves as the interface between the ACTIC and both our public and private sectors. Uh, so it's our community outreach effort on behalf of the ACTIC, uh, but it serves as that direct link between both private sector and business communities uh, and ACTIC itself. And what's really interesting is that per, uh, critical infrastructure is, is very large, right? We've got 16 sectors for critical infrastructure, but if you take a look at critical infrastructure, about 80, 85% is actually privately owned. And so we were starting to run into issues. Uh, we didn't have these relationships built uh, with our critical infrastructure partners. And so that's why that became one of our responsibilities uh, as a threat liaison officer uh, was to go out into our community and not only meet with our community stakeholders, but also with these critical infrastructure uh, partners and organizations. Uh, what we also do is collaborate with other agencies and entities within both our jurisdictions uh, as law enforcement, but uh, again, spanning the whole, whole gambit of emergency services, uh, fire, water, uh, gas, electric, you name it. Uh, we have relationships with each one of these uh, sectors, uh, and we continue to train within these sectors, building upon those relationships. And the last as the CLP, we uh, encourage reporting uh, of our committee of suspicious behaviors. And we'll kind of get into that here in a little bit. All right, and so our goals ultimately are to disseminate relevant information, right? So as the state's fusion center, uh, we serve as the hub for all information coming in and going out that pertains to either all hazards, all crimes, or most notably terrorism. And so if there's any nexus to terrorism, the ACTIC is going to, to take point on moving that information back and forth, that information exchange, if you will. And so that's one of our, our main goals of the CLP is to make sure that we're moving that information, but that way we're also communicating that information both up and down between the community and our stakeholders. Uh, we also uh, attempt to increase the visibility of ACTIC, so that's why I'm here today, uh, as well as identifying local companies or entities which have an actual stake within our critical infrastructure uh, or that are key leaders within the community. From that, we're able to, again, create relationships and build upon those relationships. And then this is very similar to FBI's InfraGuard. I don't know if any of you know InfraGuard or are members of it. So the FBI has a very similar, more business oriented and minded uh, efforts on their behalf. Uh, we actually have a pretty strong InfraGuard group here in Arizona. Um, and so if you're interested, that's also something that we can take a look at getting you guys involved with. 
information sharing. Again, we continue to go back to the act is the hub of all information moving in and out. And so what we will take in are any suspicious reporting of activity, suspicious activity. Uh, and so like these can take, uh, you know, any kind of form. It could be someone taking pictures of critical infrastructure. It could be uh, someone who is, um, you know, trying to elicit information uh, from locations that they're not supposed to be in. Uh, a good example is going up to a security guard at, at uh, Chase Field, right? And there are certain things that we're going to ask, you know, typical stuff, hey, where are the restrooms? Hey, where's the concession stand, et cetera. But if I start asking, hey, how many guards do you have on staff right now? Or, or how many security cameras do you have? That's getting past that common knowledge point and that becomes, you know, very suspicious, right? And so we've had individuals do that throughout the years uh, that we've in turn reported back up to the act. Uh, and then uh, cyber related activities. So anytime, and this is different, right? So this is different from us, uh, you know, John Q uh, citizen who's at home and it's a, oh, I've got a virus or, or something on my computer that I can clean up myself. This is a directed attack at either um, a group, an institution, or even if it's harassment through, you know, for, for an individual. Those are things that we would like to be reported uh, to about so that way we can also collaborate with our other jurisdictions to make sure that everyone is safe in our cyber realm. Uh, I personally am part of our cyber crimes task force for the FBI. I've been on it for almost 10 years. Uh, and so we see quite a bit, we see quite a bit of uh, cyber activity especially as, without getting too much into geopolitics this morning, especially as uh, crisis in Europe continues to scale up, uh, we're also seeing a scale up of uh, cyber incidents, uh, both uh, locally and abroad. And so now it's just as important of any time to make sure that we are, are taking care of ourselves both cyberly as well. Uh, and then financial crimes, et cetera. Uh, some of that stuff we can report to the FBI, but we will always take any of that info uh, if it, again, it looks to be a target of practice or anything along those lines. But ultimately it boils down to anything that just seems suspicious, but I'm not calling 911 for, that's who we recommend calling is the actor. And we'll leave the number up at the very end. All right, so this is really ultimately stating, here's all the different types and sectors of critical infrastructure. As stated before, there's 16 sectors, but this kind of starts to dive into just how much is out there that we're wanting to, to continue covering. What's really neat about the act is we have a very strong relationship with every single one of these members, key uh, members of, of these sectors. And then continued further, again, it, it even goes into national mom units. Uh, but uh, in my previous role as a threat mitigation unit detective, uh, my job was to go out to critical infrastructure and go through and, and conduct threat vulnerability assessments. We'll talk about this in a minute. Um, but we would partner regularly with DHS, our counterpart, which is the, the um, I'm sorry, the PSAs uh, that are DHS's uh, basically liaisons for the state that do the same thing we're doing, but at the federal level. And so we partner with them regularly. Uh, and then uh, we would do TBAs ourselves. So we'll kind of get out into that in a minute. All right, so this is where we, we ultimately share all of our information. Uh, before it was through email or mass emails, et cetera, but really in order to protect both us and the public, uh, we wanted to have a very secure uh, means of communication. And using HISN, the Homeland Security Information Network, is a really good way for doing that, right? And so ultimately, to get into HISN, to become a member of uh, HISN's platform, you go through a, a PCII course, uh, that's Protected Critical Infrastructure Information uh, course, uh, so that way you understand what information should be put into HISN, what shouldn't be. But it, as a member, then you're able to have information disseminated to you on a regular basis. And typically what we do is we, we try to coordinate that by sector. And so if someone belongs to a business sector, right, a tech uh, sector, uh, anything that comes into us from either the national level or the state level, and we're able to share it, we'll then turn around through his and we'll be able to disseminate that information to the same sector partners. So that way they're also aware of any threats that may be coming towards their sector. But his and ultimately right there, uh, 
the FBI will vet uh, who's uh, wanting to become a member uh, for HISN. Uh, we have that partnership. And again, that also gets you into InfraGuard, as we spoke about before. And then from there, uh, we then enter uh, you as, as a, a uh, member, and then you're able to get the information as it comes to you. This is what it looks like, a uh, secured login, has all the uh, typical DHS credentials for it. Uh, but again, it's our safe way to be able to disseminate information to and from. And what's really interesting, there's a ton of different ways to use HISN, uh, not only through for information sharing, but also this dials directly back into DHS at the federal level. And so um, just last night, we have protests uh, for Roe v. Wade uh, and what's going on down at the state capitol. And I got the message on my phone from his end, yep, hey, DPS is monitoring it, here's what's going on. Okay, now DPS is doing X, Y, and Z. And so I'm getting that information. Uh, the general public might not, but if anything did come up that was either for an area that, that you yourself were in as a member of his end, or that a business or a sector that you're in uh, was, uh, had, had a, a need to know that information, we'd be able to disseminate out uh, just giving you guys the heads up. Hey, look, be careful, shutter windows, doors, et cetera. Uh, make sure your office reads that kind of thing. And so ultimately, we feel that, that the CLP is a very necessary part of ACTIF, which is why when you go to the ACTIF website, it's one of the key points to it. Uh, our outreach is everything, right? And so without us, uh, our outreach and without the community knowing what ACTIF is doing, Unfortunately, we're just a secret group that's, you know, dwindling away. Uh, and so, again, it takes these outreach uh, efforts on our part to make sure that the entire public is aware and utilizing the ACTIC as best they can. Uh, so that keeps lines of communication open, not only for our federal, state, uh, local, tribal, et cetera, uh, <clears throat> but also our community. And then, again, networking with our public and private se sector stakeholders, uh, and then as we are able to do that, we're creating and building upon our relationships. And so that's key for us, right? Uh, and that's the real reason that uh, for a lot of things, but for, for instance, the FBI Cyber Task Force, um, I don't know anything about, I didn't know anything about cyber when I first came on. Like it was just, I know a computer, I know how to turn it on, I know how to get to the web. That's about as cyber as I got, right? But because we had these relationships, these established relationships throughout the entire critical infrastructure network, uh, FBI said, look, every time we go to, to one of these critical infrastructure sites, which again, 80 plus percent is, is uh, privately owned, right? Every time we go, we knock on the door and say, hey, we're here with the feds, we're here to help. And they go, yeah, no thanks. But you have those relationships. And so we would love to be able to partner with you, teach you enough to be dangerous for you to be able to go with us into these situations. And it's been a really good uh, partnership between us and the FBI because of that. And so again, working together to leverage those relationships is what's key for ACTIF. Uh, and then last, uh, liaison, we can provide to the community liaison between uh, anyone within the community and the ACTIF. Uh, and then we also provide training, we'll get to that in a minute, uh, connect you with other agencies, including federal agencies. So sometimes it's one thing to pick up the phone and call the FBI and maybe you get someone, maybe you don't get someone, but you know, you have to sit and wait for a hotline, et cetera. And it's kind of a pain, right? And then they have to sift through all those, those individuals that have called because they have a lot of people that call, a lot of people that like to, to talk uh, and, and, uh, and continue to talk. <laughs> so anyways, it's very difficult to, to really connect with someone if you have a real serious issue, right? And so we, if you go to the active, we're able to kind of help cut through the noise, right? Uh, that's one benefit that we're able to provide. Uh, and then the last, any outreach within uh, your area uh, to infrastructure, right? And so um, take, for instance, we go back to tech, right? And so if uh, you as a new tech company uh, are within this area and you'd like to know who else is in there so that way you can connect, uh, that you can uh, coordinate, et cetera, uh, we have those, those uh, relationships established. All right, training resources. So ultimately, this is the big thing that we can offer to the community, right? So my training resources that I provide specifically, and uh, not to get too too wild about it, but 
in, in the military, we call this left of boom, right of boom, right? So ultimately, we're trying to get in front of the bad day uh, by providing training that is meant to mitigate uh, any of those risks or threats uh, of that bad day happening, right? And so our very first and foremost, and it's all organic, right? It's, it, it all kind of plays together. And so our first training that we provide uh, is threat, burn, uh, threat vulnerability assessments. And this isn't quite training, it's more so us coming through and helping to do an assessment of your organization or your facility. Uh, and in doing so, we're able to identify risks uh, that there may be, and they might be small things, right? Uh, uh, doors that are propped open or, um, you know, firewalls that aren't, uh, you know, installed, et cetera, working properly, or heck, you know, it's awesome. Everyone comes in and goes, I have the best cybersecurity program there is. Well, but the closet door to your servers isn't working correctly. And so like, how, how safe is it really? Uh, and so we take both physical and cyber when we look at it. And in doing so, it helps us to understand what our vulnerabilities are as an organization or uh, a small entity, right? And so from that, becoming more aware about ourselves, then we start getting into preparation for the bad day happening, right? And so we also uh, provide a DHS training, which is called Bomb Making Awareness and Preparedness Training. Uh, BMAP ultimately uh, is a way for the community to understand what, what really constitutes a bomb uh, or an explosive device, right? And what are some of the chemical precursors, et cetera? So if you were to walk into, and again, as a community member, you might not, but uh, if you see a neighbor that's starting to, to hoard quite a bit of you know, hydrogen peroxide or things like that, that's suspicious, right? Uh, because some of these chemical precursors in enough uh, of a quantity can be dangerous, right? And so that's kind of one of the things that we uh, also train through DHS, uh, it's a DHS training. Uh, but again, it's an awareness for our community members to identify, oh, hey, that actually might be bad. Uh, and at the end of it, it's actually pretty cool. Uh, you actually see, uh, um, you know, uh, makeup images of, or actual uh, devices, et cetera, and how they do that. Uh, and then moving forward, active shooter preparedness training. This is kind of one of the big uh, trainings that is asked for quite a bit of the ACTIC. Uh, but we all ultimately always tie it back to, you know, if we're going to do active shooter training, we definitely want to get uh, a TBA done beforehand, right? Um, and so active shooter preparedness training can range the gambit between as simple as an online training that we provide through DHS uh, or a PowerPoint that we can provide. Uh, all the way up to actual live actor training to where we've got, uh, you know, it's not sim rounds, but they're like little nerf gun kind of things, right? But it's at your organization's facility after we've already gone through and identified what the risks and, and ways to mitigate those are, gone and, and trained. And then at the very end, you, it's a culmination, you put it all together and you're running around uh, with, with an actual live training. And it's really great. If anyone's been through it, it's actually really, really good training. And then last, we also, uh, through our Phoenix Fire Department, we put on stoppably. And so that's kind of a trauma mitigation, uh, how to deal with gunshot wounds, uh, and um, it goes well beyond CPR. And at the end of the class, uh, you get a training kit for it too. So these are all things that we, the CLP, offer through ACTIC. And ACTIC offers uh, several other things too. Um, you know, if someone is experiencing threats to a specific individual, we have the stamp program. And stamp program is very similar to us doing a TPA, but it's meant for individuals specifically uh, and to where there's a scoring involved and everything else. But that's another resource that, that the ACTIC can provide. Uh, but these are all our community resources that we provide. And these uh, primarily are at no cost. Now, some of the live action stuff we can do ourselves, but if you're looking for higher up, then we can start discussing private companies, et cetera. That's nothing that we endorse specifically, uh, but some companies that we've seen that work really well. And then as we continue to build upon our relationship, again, we have things such as this, speaking opportunities. I've spoke well, numerous times at uh, Southwest Gas, Kinder Morgan, uh, APS, SRP, you name it, right? Um, and so that's something else that we provide as the CLP is any opportunity to come out to engage with the community or with an organization. Uh, informational webinars or stakeholder calls. 
Uh, this was real big, especially when we were having a lot of cyber stuff going on, Log4j, I don't know if any of you are aware of it. Uh, it was several months ago, but that was a huge crisis for cyber. Uh, and from that, we had several stakeholder calls that were involved with cyber security uh, threat mitigation. Uh, and that was something that we offered to all of our partners was being able to get onto those stakeholder calls. And some of those were DHS led at a national level too. And that was actually really, really neat to see. Uh, connecting with different organizations that work at ACTIC, as mentioned before, uh, we're not the only ones there. There's several other that work up at ACTIC and several jurisdictions that work up at ACTIC. And it's really interesting. So we've got, you know, the feds are up there. Uh, we've got DHS, TSA, et cetera. Uh, then we've got all the local uh, agencies that are up there. And if they're not sitting there in a desk, they they have presence up there every now and then. Uh, and we have a huge network. We have 2,000 plus TLOs, threat liaison officers, uh, that are throughout the entire state that basically are um, plugged directly into the act. And so if anything does happen out, out in their jurisdiction or even dialing right into their community, they're able to start working that network immediately. And it's, uh, it's reach back is incredible. And so not only does it reach back to ACTIC and, and have state resources, but it also reaches back to the feds. And we have, we have detectives that sit uh, every six weeks are up at um, our National Operations Center in DC uh, to where they're plugged directly in with the national uh, incidents and are able to start reporting real time. And it's actually really cool. Uh, some of the reports that we've had have actually ended up on POTUS's desk. Yes, sir. Just a quick question. Please. Who is your boss? Who do you guys report up to? The state? Yeah, so, so it's really oddball, right? Like, so for me being a Phoenix police detective, I have a sergeant that I report to. And so my chain of command is still Phoenix PD. But because we have a partnership in ACTIC and we reside at ACTIC, uh, I, I personally, for this program, report to our director. And so we have a director at the ACTIC uh, who is our primary stakeholder for the entire intelligence community for here, for the state, mm -hmm. right? Um, and she has her directorship um, underneath her. She's got an assistant director and a few other assistant directors, one of intelligence, et cetera. And she reports up. Exactly. Her. And so, and, and that's a great question. Let me take a second to kind of explain it. So back in 2004, right, uh, nationally, a laws were passed at the federal level that said every state will enact a fusion center and a TLO program, basically, right? And so from that, we stood up the ACTIC, the Arizona Counterterrorism Information Center. And it was, it was wild back then, right? The wild, wild west. And so we were grabbing everyone we could that had some sort of connection to anti-terrorism, counterterrorism, et cetera, and brought them all in and kind of you know, put this together. Since then, uh, we've gone back to New York. We've gone back to some other you know, key uh, fusion centers and have adopted a lot of their techniques to where we have now become one of the, the um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the focal points uh, for the entire West, Southwest uh, for fusion centers. Uh, people are now coming to tour our facility because we've done so well at being able to, to stand this program up over the course of the past almost 10 years, uh, 20 years. So from that, to answer your question, law is enacted, state law is enacted that says you shall have a fusion center, you shall have a critical infrastructure program, you shall have an intelligence program that disseminates information, right? Because we don't ever want to have that, that happen again, 9 11 happen again. And so, from that, uh, ACTIC is ran at the state by the state. Uh, so, DPS is the primary agency over it. And so, my director of ACTIC, she reports directly to uh, the director of DPS. So, and that's a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, meetings with other agencies, jurisdictions, that's where we left off. So again, if you're looking to meet with a community action officer or uh, your neighborhood precinct lieutenant or something along those lines uh, and have been having a hard time trying to get a hold of them, because again, we, we know everyone's really busy, right, and, and short staff. Uh, we have the ability to kind of cut through that noise again and, and directly contact it and get to some of the, the key players that we need to. Uh, sharing contacts and updates. Again, everything is kept close best because uh, oftentimes it's it's related to critical infrastructure. And so without permission from the, the other side, uh, we can't just give contact information out. But if you're looking for spe uh, specific organizations, et cetera, we have all those relationships built. And if you're trying to find someone, we can typically find someone to help connect you. 
and then advocating within your own organization is the way that we're going to continue to build upon our our our, our uh, you know active uh, efforts. As stated before, again, we're just a tiny little spot tucked away in North Phoenix. You know, a secret spot that's listed in the white pages. Uh, <laughs> but uh, again, without the community's awareness and without the community's help at continuing to utilize <laughs> ACTIC and their resources, we're just going to be the tucked away spot. So um, let's see. All right. And then uh, here's some other stuff that we do putting together bulletins for uh, information dissemination. Uh, again, this kind of goes towards our sectors. Uh, you know, uh, hospitality is a, a good one, right? Uh, hospitality, as we get closer to large events, see an uptick in uh, thefts and in human trafficking, more, more related to sex trafficking, right? And so when those events start coming up, um, they have a really good network of hotels, et cetera. Um, however, they don't reach everyone. And so that's another way for us. We have a lot of those uh, established relationships with some of the smaller uh, entities that might not be within their bigger uh, organization. Uh, that we can disseminate out to everyone within that sector. Hey, look, here's something to look for. We've got, you know, this event coming in. Make sure that you're keeping an eye out for this, for that, et cetera. Uh, and then inviting other pertinent public and private sector personnel to become part of it. Right? So again, going out and telling your friends is what this is, right? Uh, InfraGuard is a really good uh, organization, but it's, it's business-based. And then HISN, again, is just another way for us to be able to disseminate information securely to uh, the, the, the public and the community. All right, last, uh, in closing, 911 if it's an emergency, right? And so uh, we encourage everyone, if you run into any suspicious activity, but it is volatile or is an emergency, please call 911. Uh, that's first and foremost, your safety is first and foremost, be a good witness, uh, not not a hero, right? Um, and so again, I can't stress enough. If you see an emergency, call nine one one. However, the other phone number that's reactive, right? Suspi suspicious activity. Uh, let me give a couple of examples, right? I was uh, we they were just opening the right light rail over um, uh, the airport down at Sky Harbor, right? They were doing a new section, and uh, the tram was going, et cetera. And when I was driving through the airport one day. I see a vehicle pulled off to the side underneath one of the, the tram rails, and there's a person outside taking a photograph of, of the tram itself and the, the, the surroundings about it, uh, ultimately kind of diving into what the tram is doing, right? Um, and again, it wasn't a, uh, an Instagram-worthy photo that they were taking. This was actually a, a serious photo that they were trying to take of it. Uh, and at that point, it was a, no, that's something that's suspicious. Let me call it. And so then our airport has TLOs that are assigned to the airport and a TLO from the airport stood up, came out, and then started going through video footage, et cetera, to try and nail down who that individual was. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of stuff that we're encouraging. Hey, look, if it just doesn't feel right, it's kind of out of place, give us a call. We'll always take a look at it. Uh, and then that's it. Here's my contact info. Now, please take it down. Uh, again, I'm free at any time. Uh, I've got my ring around all the time. That's my cell. Uh, and so if you have any further questions uh, that you want to talk about offline, feel free to give me a call, drop me an email. Uh, that's me. So uh, I, we're opening up the floor for questions. If anyone has any questions about the program or about the active or anything else, please feel free. Do you have any success stories of things that you've been able to mitigate before it happened or something? Things that in, in, in the intelligence community, right? Uh, our failures are known and our, our wins are our secret, right? Uh, but to, to give you some, um, we've stopped several things, right? Um, we also partner with the, the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Um, and so that's, that's another thing that was stood up in 2004 with those mandates was being able to mitigate some of these threats uh, at a national level. Uh, dialing it through the states. And so our JTTF is plugged directly in with what we're doing. Uh, and so a lot of our tips that I should tell some of our tips that come in um, are then pushed up to what the FBI calls their e-guardian system, right? And that's their tips and leads. And then they sift through it. And then if there's any nexus to terrorism, they're sending it over to our JTTF. And so there's been a handful that have gone off to JTTF that we've been able to mitigate things because of people in the community seeing something and going, it's just not right. Um, and 
uh, uh, yeah, uh, there. <laughs> I'm trying to go through all the ones, and I'm like, well, they have that one, but I can't talk about that one. Um, uh, so, Garland, Texas is a good one. Um, I won't go into the details of it, uh, but uh, we were able to mitigate that before it went sideways. Um, and so that was a really good one. Uh, and there's a ton of others that are local here. Um, uh, we were, I, I, I did a case years ago. I did a case where we're getting a bunch of tips and leads from uh, Kinder Morgan, which is the, the big feeder to Southwest Gas here, right? Um, and so Kinder Morgan and some of their transfer sites to Southwest Gas uh, we're having a lot of vandalism. This was years ago. A lot of vandalism. And I've seen it pop up all in the East Valley. And so I was just watching it as it was continuing to go. We had like something like 30 or 40 vandalisms to where someone was actually going in and manipulating the pipe to vent gas. Uh, and in some instances, it was either under a huge power line, KB500s, or uh, that was directly related to a, a hospital. Uh, and so some of these incidents were, were getting a little hairy, right? And so finally, we were able to start leveraging some of our federal and our state uh, uh, resources, uh, writing uh, warrants, et cetera. And, and then we also partnered with the, the Kinder Morgan and Southwest Gas, and they started putting up game cameras at some of their key locations. Uh, and then from that, we were able to identify the individual who was doing it and put a stop to it immediately. We served a search warrant on him and his house and everything else. Turned out just to be some crazy guy. Uh, but uh, who was worried that gas was was killing the earth, and so that's why he was venting it. Um, but ultimately, he was arrested and, and put away uh, because of it. And so we were able to finally stop it. Uh, granted, it wasn't before it happened, but because the actic was able to see it, and because we were able to leverage re uh, resources and relationships, it actually turned out really good. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your comments. Of course. I have a question for clarity. So if I'm outside of Paradise Valley and I see suspicious activity, as you suggested near the airport, calling me makes sense. So in Paradise Valley, if I see something that's suspicious, when of that nature, when might I call you and when might I call an non-emergency line? Okay. Please, Chief. So uh, yeah, great question. Uh, and actually, we're we're locked in with uh, Actic pretty regularly. We have uh, TLOs here, um, Detective Calendar mentioned the TLO threat uh, liaison officers. And uh, so we have a couple of them, and one of them actually sitting in the room, uh, who does TVA's threat vulnerability assessments at the houses of worship. So if, if it's happening here, please give us a call, and we can get in contact with uh, Detective Calendar and his team as well. Yep, and so how that works, just like she's saying, it goes both ways. It can either go through through the agency itself, or if you've got this number and it's right there in your phone and you call us, we're going to call the TLO that's assigned to, to that jurisdiction, uh, no matter where it's at, right? So we give first right refusal, right? Uh, especially because that TLO is so dialed into the community that they're the ones we want being able to handle that. Uh, instead of me going in and cold contacting a, a community member that may have a really perfectly good relationship with their jurisdiction, right? So I'm always going to leverage, even through our TBAs, we're calling the, the jurisdiction's TLOs to come out. We're calling their fire group to come out. Uh, we're also calling their local uh, you know, precinct or, or bureau or whoever it is to come out as well. So that way we have that connect dialed in directly to the community. And again, that's one of the ways that they communicate back to us if they recognize a threat at one of the resorts, something to that effect at, at an event. Um, they'll come, they'll reach out through the TLOs and we'll get that information back. Yes, sir. Looking at the magnitude of your responsibilities <laughs> uh, and all of the entities, both public and private, mm -hmm. you provide your services to, what's your organization look like in terms of manpower? So at the Arctic, uh, we have 30 some odd personnel without getting too much into it. Uh, so we're a very small entity, um, but our reach back is incredible. As I mentioned before, while I may have I think it's something like 30 active TLOs, I have 2000 that I can turn to instantly, right? And then from that, we have just Phoenix alone. Uh, I helped stand up an intelligence officer program several years ago. And from that, I've got 250 other officers that I can leverage to start working intel at the drop of a hat. So, like, there's a lot of really good resources. And it's, again, it's all relationship building, right? And, and I tell my young officers, I can't go out and, and stop everything within the 500 square mile, 1.6 million people 
me trying to do this job, as you pointed out, can't do it, right? And so that's why I leverage both my officers, uh, fire department, and my community to become those uh, sources of information that they're able to go, hey, mm, something's wrong. And so instead of me trying to find it, now I have several others that are out there looking for it too. So the 37 that you referenced, are they all sworn police officers? So what's really interesting about our TLO program, it's it's very different from back east. Back east, it's you know, PD's got theirs, fire's got theirs, no one really you know uh, works too well together. Out here, it's incredible. Uh, and oftentimes we get comments from back east, why would you do it that way? Well, here's why, right? So like for the TLO program, for instance, right? We have sworn officers in it. I have uh, firefighters that are in it. Uh, and we take pride in that because anytime we go out to an event, uh, I'm looking at it from a cop's perspective, which might not be uh, the way that the bad guy's looking at it from, but if a fire guy's looking at something different, right, that, that could help too. And there's been several instances of that. Uh, we were out at NASCAR. We cover a large scale, that's right. We're out at NASCAR. Um, my TLOs are out there walking in plain clothes, right? Uh, that's another thing that we provide. Uh, and so my plain clothes guys are usually a, a firefighter and, a, and an officer partnered together, right? Again, so they have two different perspectives of seeing it. And the firefighter's been able to catch a lot of different stuff, right? Uh, like, hey, look, I've got a ton of cans here that are next to a heat source, and that's going to go boom here in a few minutes. And so we're able to go, oh, no, no, let's not do that, right? Or, hey, look, I've got noxious fumes that are coming emanating from a certain location, and I've got a fire guy that's able to go, hey, look, here's where we're at, right? Uh, I don't have any major casualties. I've got some inhalation. They're off to the side, that kind of thing. And they're able to start working stuff real time on the ground. Uh, that if it was just PD, we wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, and then what's really awesome with our TLO program, we also have community members that are in it as well, key stakeholders of organizations that are part of it. So I went through with uh, someone from Southwest Gas, someone from uh, TSA, like it's really interesting. If if there's a need for it, we look at putting it here. Any other questions? Well, no, well, the sure, please. <laughs> I went through the FBI Citizens Academy some years ago, and uh, one of the things that really interested me, well, a lot of it, all of it really interested me, but gang-related activity. I'm wondering how what you do uh, assesses the threat from that element. So, and that's a really good point. So we get a lot of tips in about everything, right? And I, I joke with my, my new uh, officers, Typically, our tips and leads, I'd say a good 80% are uh, drug related, right? Uh, so and so's got, you know, uh, this at their house. So and so smoke back here, et cetera, et cetera. Or hey, so and so's got cars stopping by their house every night. We still want those, right? And what happens is I've got call takers uh, that stand within our walk center because we've got uh, it's, uh, about twice the size of this room. I've got cubicles, I've got uh, computers uh, and monitors across the screen, and we're doing real time stuff left and right, right? Um, and so I've got call takers uh, that are standing there getting these tips as they come in in real time and they're assessing them. And if it has anything to do with drugs, I'm sending it to my DEB or the jurisdiction's drug unit. If it has anything to do with gangs, I'm sending it to my gang unit or the jurisdiction's gang unit. Like they're just sending it where it needs to go. And so that's another great way for the community to be able to reach out. They might not know who their gang unit is, but if they can send us the information, we get that information to the gang unit. And then we've worked several times because we have intelligence analysts embedded at the active. We've worked several times in large scale programs, being able to provide criminal intelligence instead of intelligence intelligence, right? Criminal intelligence as a way to help mitigate some of these, these threats for our communities. Great question. Sir. So when you're working with different departments, in, in essence, you're you're getting the ball, you're throwing the ball into somebody else's court. Is there any kind of feedback loop that they say? Yeah, we got this, or you throw the ball into a couple and they go, oh, well, they've got it, so I don't need to do anything with it, so it falls in the tracks. And that's a really good point. Like, uh, I'm not going to lie, the system isn't perfect, right? And so, well, that day is never going to be perfect. Absolutely, and that's exactly it. And so, there are things that will fall through the cracks occasionally, uh, but persistence is everything, right? And so, uh, we love the squeaky wheel. Right. And so it, there's been times where something's come in, we've sent it off to an entity and that entity hasn't responded, hasn't received it immediately, et cetera. And the individual calls back. At that point, I'm able to go, huh, OK, that's a phone call instead of an email or that's a phone call versus me sending the tip over to their tip, you know, tip plan. Uh, 
And that's that's the best part about our information hub that acting is that we're persistent. And then if we don't see that feedback loop, that we're, we're in, in, uh, initiating that feedback loop to make sure that, that we're getting our people taken care of. Other questions or comments? There's plenty of coffee in the back. I just want to recognize a couple of dignitaries I have in the room. Uh, Mayor Bian Wilma, welcome. Vice Mayor Ronald Thomason, welcome. Uh, Council Member Mark Stanton. Uh, I also have advisory committee members here, Kathy Petsis in the back, Jay Ozer in the middle. And again, if you don't know me, I'm Chief Pete Wingert. Uh, welcome to my department. I always say that I have the best team in blue uh, in the state, at least maybe in the nation. Uh, and there's a couple of them sitting in the back. Please, while you're here, uh, get the, take the time to get to know somebody here, have a cup of coffee so that you know us as Chief Pete versus the cops. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Any questions for me uh, today about anything other than the program? I'm appreciative of you guys coming today. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you Detective Callen. <laughs>